Hi, everyone. My name's Nick. I'm a software engineer at Google working on Android's LLVM team. Uh, my name's Chi. I'm on the Android team also. And we're here to today to tell you a little bit about our work on uh, building the Linux kernel with Clang and uh, working with Linaro towards, towards its goal. So just a brief timeline of, of things. Uh, so Clang itself was, was open sourced from Apple in, I think, 2007, LLVM a little bit earlier than that. Uh, the first kind of started trying to dig and find early records of, of people chewing on this. But um, the idea being the first known case I could find of someone trying to build the Linux kernel with Clang, someone filed a meta bug about this back in 2009 and a few other issues in LLVM's issue tracker in 2009. Uh, so people have been chewing on this for, for about 10 years um, kind of thing. I think I found a post on LLVM's mailing list. Someone said, like, I got it to boot kind of thing. Um, 2011, there's a GitHub team called the LLL project. I think the L, first two Ls are LLVM and then Linux project. Um, through 2012 to 2016, there was a, a, another group called the LLVM Linux project, had an extensive set of kind of patches to the kernel. Uh, when I started taking a look into this in 2016, um, me and one of my former teammates, Greg, um, kind of dusted off some of these old LLVM Linux patches um, and, and basically got our Google Pixel 1 device um, booting uh, and, and running with a, with a Clang built kernel. Um, at the time, I don't think we had upstreamed anything. Uh, this was like we just got it kind of working and it was right after the device shipped kind of thing. So our <coughs> leadership kind of advised us to uh, try again for Pixel 2 and, and get things like uh, kind of well tested in, in, in place and take measurements in these things. And so we ended up shipping Pixel 2 in 2017 with a Clang built kernel, ARM64 device. Um, same, around the same, uh, same year, uh, my colleague Matthias on Chrome OS uh, had sent these two um, essentially kind of patch sets that they were using in Chrome OS. Uh, the idea being trying to minimize the amount of out of tree code that we had for, for building the kernel with Clang. Uh, 2018, Chrome OS uh, started shipping Clang built kernels as their default for, for all 4.4 and newer kernels. Uh, for Pixel 3, uh, I think we ended up shipping Pixel 3 with LTO builds of our kernel and something called control flow integrity analysis is a, kind of a sec security technique for defending against certain classes of kind of ROP chains, uh, is my understanding. Uh, 2019, some of the things that, that we've been looking into are uh, using LLVM's linker, LLD. Uh, that, that's good to go and turned on on a build. It'll ship later this year in a device. Uh, LLVM AR, I believe, is ready to go. I'm uh, at least upstream mainline Linux for all architectures I've tested it with is, is ready to go. Um, Shadow call stack is another technology that is used for preventing yet another class of ROP chain attacks. Um, that, that's up and running as well. So there's still uh, some amount of work to do to kind of upstream some of these features as well into mainline Linux. Um, so I always get this question like, does it work? And the answer is it's a little complicated because for the Linux kernel, you have many, many different architectures. And so the first kind of question is, well, can Clang target them or not? Um, so Clang doesn't necessarily have a backend that can target all these different architectures that, that the kernel does support. Um, I would say we're probably the furthest along with ARM64, uh, thanks to help from a lot of folks at, at Linaro. Um, so an all yes config is, is pretty much done, uh, I think, Chi just finished off the last remaining compiler error with the... Uh, uh, there's still some bugs <laughs> for now. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we're sitting in the airport kind of thing, and, and we get a, a, a zero-day bot email kind of thing. We're like, oh, yeah, oops. If you just rent config doesn't build. Whatever. <laughs> it's like a six-line patch to fix it. it, it <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, we forgot what happens if you turn off modules. Okay. Um, uh, ARMv5, v6, v7, PowerPC32, and PowerPC64, little endian def configs, um, build and boot. Uh, for a lot of these architectures, there's something called RAN config. It's like a coin flip of configs turned on and off. Uh, I can't guarantee you that for any given one, Clang will just work. Um, but I, I think folks have done a lot of great work. Um, Art, in particular, right, did something like 50 something RAN config builds, right, and was able to, to find lots of issues. Oh, and I do a thousand. Wow. 
<laughs> okay, so just, just, just for the camera, Hard said he does a thousand Rand config builds a day kind of thing. So, so, and I get no warnings. Right. Um, so I think with Rand config, it's always like a game of whack-a-mole, um, just because theoretically we still don't have entire coverage of every possible configuration. But like for sane configurations that you probably would use, I think we're in good shape. Um, there's a, something called config jump label, is a kind of interesting uh, technology used in the kernel um, for kind of changing, branching dynamically at, at runtime. So the kernel, while it's booting, will actually patch itself and insert either NOP sleds or jumps. And then like later on, if you want to trace things, it can kind of patch these points. It's, it's very, very tricky and complicated. Um, x86 made it required for their architecture back in February of last year. Um, and so uh, it's been a work in progress kind of implementing this in, in Clang and LLVM. So uh, L I think the back end support of this landed in LLVM in the Clang 8 release, but the front end code, um, I held it back because uh, we basically needed to be able to inline ASM go to in the kernel. Um, and we still have some bugs with not patching the code correctly. That, like, that's been my focus for the past two weeks is trying to, to debug that. Um, but we, we have kind of basic cron jobs that, that, that we run nightly just to catch any kind of um, breakages, kind of looking at mainline Linux, Linux Next, um, and all the LTS branches. So the idea is basically by, by turning a very large code base against this compiler and a new compiler at this code base, um, the hope is to try to improve kind of both code bases, right? And I would say um, the Linux code base itself is a very unique code base compared to some of the other open source code bases that, that you might kind of throw at it. And I would say um, Linux in general really stresses um, Clang support for, for inline assembly. So there's kind of inline assembly where you just have you know, a string and you know, the compiler treats it as a black box, just insert into the object code you know, at this point kind of thing. Um, but then there's uh, uh, extended inline assembly, which has its own constraint language. Uh, these constraints can be either generic or machine specific kind of thing. I find like I always need the manual out whenever I'm like looking at it or trying to understand it. Um, so Clang, Clang does have an integrated assembler as well. Um, so we find all kinds of missing, missing features that Clang's assembler doesn't understand, particularly um, GAS, uh, the GNU assembler has uh, kind of higher level pseudo instructions that are actually nice um, to use. It's just when you write them, I think if you then assemble the object file and disassemble it, you get like a, a multiple instructions out of it. So some, like some of those are missing. We found through um, trying to assemble the Linux kernel with LOVM. Um, a lot of the GNU C extensions, I would say Clang supports almost all of them. The two that I, I can think of off the top of my head that aren't supported are um, inline functions, which also are closures, you can close over um, <coughs> variables in an outer scope, um, are not supported in Nested Clang. Functions. What? Nested functions. Yes, yeah. You said inline functions. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, nested functions. Yeah, inline functions for sure are supported. Nested functions, sorry, is what I meant, uh, which can also be closures. And then um, variable length arrays in a structure. So it is possible to declare uh, an array, you don't know the size until runtime. You can put one of these in a structure um, hopefully at the end of it, but if you put it in the middle of the structure, that's like a GNU C extension that isn't implemented yet in Clang. Luckily, the kernel doesn't make use of either of these, and for the variable length arrays and structs, uh, dash W VLA is turned on for the Linux kernel. Um, I would say the, the Linux kernel really stresses LLD uh, support for, for linker scripts. Um, in, in general, I think embedded programming uh, will will make heavier use of, of kind of linker scripts and, and advanced linker support than maybe more traditional application level programming. Uh, we found that the Linux kernel boot time is very sensitive to kind of code size. Um, so you know ultimately we would like the code to be as fast as possible and we'd like the kernel to, to boot as fast as possible as well but you have this dichotomy sometimes of like if we just were to inline just a little bit more Right, we end up making the code larger, and then like maybe it runs faster, but doesn't like it boots slower, kind of thing. So, you know that that's something that that comes up often, um, and and I think the Linux kernel is probably the largest open source C code base there is. Um, if someone knows one that's larger, I'd be curious to know. But but uh, um, so I think like in it, 
those are kind of um, different parts of the, the LLVM code base that the Linux kernel really stresses. You want to talk about this one? Uh, all right. So there are a number of things we uh, changed around in LLVM to to this to make this effort work. Um, so f no delete null pointer checks we added to Clang. Uh, so this is in the category uh, of things where compiler can detect undefined behavior or just behavior that's not necessarily in the standard. And it might rip out null pointer checks out of the code. And uh, in the Linux kernel, a lot of times um, the null pointer checks are, are really, really required. So uh, we needed to add this flag and the ability to specify, uh, th to tell the compiler that null pointer checks are really needed there. Um, so another thing we added to Clang 7, um, so in ARM32, you refer to general purpose registers by their uh, R prefix, so they're named R0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And in ARM64, uh, you prefix them with X and W for 64-bit and 32-bit respectively. And uh, the new assembler actually allows you to refer to a register by, let's say, R9 in ARM64 code. So the Linux uh, code a lot of times actually refers to registers by their old ARM32 names. So we, we added support for the old ARM32 names to Clang. Um, so config ARM64 LSE atomics. Uh, this particular config actually relies on custom calling conventions um, for performance reasons. Um, so to actually support this config, we added two flags to Clang. Uh, a fixed flag allows us to reserve general uh, purpose registers. And f call safe flag, uh, what it does is it uh, specifies additional call safe registers. So uh, as Nick mentioned, ASM go to is a big ticket item for us. Um, the support for it in uh, LVM is already merged. And as was already <coughs> mentioned, uh, the front end is pending. Uh, ETA is Clang 9 is going to have the support. Um, another thing uh, that was merged into Clang 9 is support for GCC ASM flag output. So let's say you have an ASM block. Uh, and you want to form an output that is based upon one of the flag's registers. Uh, that was formerly not possible to do in Clang, uh, but we added output operands uh, to as in blocks uh, in Clang to support that. S will go to will be supported for all architectures. Uh, so there's nothing, as far as I know, there's nothing that's architecture specific. Uh, right now, when I try to build an ARM64 kernel with like the front end support plus my inlining support, uh, I think I hit an issue related to what do we consider an integer constant expression. So assuming we get that fixed as well in the Clang 9 release, I don't think that there should be anything architecture specific. Kind of thing. But th that's more of like, how is this construct being used in the Linux kernel? Otherwise, there's nothing architecture specific about, about ASM go to in Clang. Uh, we've also made a number of changes in the Linux code base. Uh, so we recently added support for Clang implementation of GCUF. Uh, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, the thing just got merged. Things are a little bit broken, but uh, hopefully the next merge window is going to be in mainline. Uh, so the advantage of building Linux with different compilers is that you get a larger coverage of warning checks and different static analysis tools. Uh, so when we build Linux with Clang, we actually see a lot of warnings that are not caught in GCC, and we try to fix all of those too. Uh, all right, let's, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this. Uh, let's go through an example of one of the fun bugs we caught with uh, Clang warnings. Anyone can spot what's, what might be wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can turn off the lights over here. Kind of thing. That'll work. The hint here is that W sometimes initialized flag this code as work. potentially not okay. 
yeah, I th it's probably going to be pretty difficult for the audience to see. But the idea is uh, like trying to find use of uninitialized memory here. So we have a pointer we declare. We don't initialize it. We have some conditional code uh, that modifies this variable dialect. Afterwards, we initialize the variable. Then we use the variable. The issue here, you can be forgiven if you didn't see it, because I didn't see it the first time I saw the code. That's a comma right there. Yeah. Yeah. So the initialization of opcode variable is actually conditional. It's within this if block. So its use here is undefined behavior. Um, so there's like we have a in our issue tracker, uh, you know, big list of of all these you can go through and, and check. But I think that was one of the ones most recently that I thought was kind of interesting. I actually Sorry. didn't even know how they parsed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Uh, the, the whole effort of building Linux with Clang, it, it drives improvements on, in both code bases. Uh, Gitlog uh, will show you that there are more than 1,000 commit messages that mention Clang in the Linux kernel and more than 100 of commits in the LVM that are target, targeted specifically at Linux. All right, so how do we prevent progressions and make sure that we continuously moving forward with uh, this effort? So this is where uh, kernel CI comes in. Um, currently, we have nightly builds of the Linux Next branch, uh, and it's done in staging right now. They're just any, any time Linux Next updated. It's not nightly. Uh, Sorry, I don't know. So you, your point is? It's, all, it's, not built, it's not that it's built nightly. It's built every time Linux Next is updated. Oh, okay. yeah. It's not like a, a Oh, sorry. Is is Linux Next not updated on a 24-hour basis? It's uh, just sometimes it takes days off. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and sometimes if there's a big whoopsie, it might update at another time. But um, yeah, it, it's it, you won't get built every day. You'll only get built when there's an update. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we're planning to move the the CI to production as soon as possible, and potentially to scale it to. Uh, more branches other than Linux Next. And Linar TCWG is also helping us with uh, continuous testing. Well, uh, so uh, whenever Linux Next is updated, we get build reports. Uh, the CI sends us a pretty concise build report and uh, contains all the necessary information that we might need uh, for triaging in case there are problems. So, yeah, it's probably too small for you guys to see, but it uh, it will have the branch name, the config name, and all the errors that occurred during build. Um, so with this build report, we can actually triage things pretty quickly, and we're notified pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, as soon as Linux uh, Next is updated. Uh, and a lot of times, the fixes are fairly simple. So what this allows us to do is actually fix problems in Linux Next, before they hit mainline. And this has been a, a huge value add for us because things don't progress as often. But nowadays, most of the new bugs you'll see are not compiler specific, right? So they will show up in both GCC and Clang. Or what's the ratio? Uh, OK, so uh, this p particular bot builds with Clang for us. Uh, I don't really have numbers. Yeah, I, I don't know if we have statistics about that, but Max? I would say that GCC breaks with, uh, Linux breaks with GCC once in two weeks, so LVM every week. Well, LVM should, should be every day, right? Because we, we have the GCOF patches. Yeah, yeah, until the GCOF <laughs> patches are merged. Yeah. Well, Oh, this is from the perspective of, of like building top of tree LLVM and compiling the Linux kernel with it. Compared to the previous day. Top of yep. tree kernel with top of tree compiler. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say LLVM is is pretty noisy upstream development. Uh, people tend to step on each other's toes. I don't 
it, it, it was quite a while until I was able to push a patch to LLVM without breaking like the Windows build. For instance, it, it's tough. There's a lot of build targets, a lot of folks using it. So um, kind of what's, what's next, um, I, I would say I was thinking of this project a lot of like, you know, get it building, getting, get it booting, get it running, get it running well kind of thing. I would say I feel like we're pretty close to being done with the getting, getting it building. Typically, if it builds, it will boot. If it, if it doesn't boot, you know, those are less fun bugs to try to fix um, kind of thing. And then from there, we're able to kind of focus on both building features like, like the LTO and the kernel, like, she had a call stack, um, uh, like build additional features, but then also start applying polish, right? And start looking at, you know, what can we be doing better, right? So I would say kind of the next things on, on the radar that I can think of off the top of my head are, um, like my personal goals are to finish off ASM go to, not have to worry about that anymore. Um, Arnd identified some interesting cases where Clang doesn't aggressively sync the lifetime of variables in order to reuse stack slots. Um, I think that this may be an artifact of Clang being really well tested and used as a C++ compiler and the C++ style of declare things as late as possible um, near where they're used versus uh, the kernel style, C89 style of like declare things up front. That way you can kind of eyeball the stack usage in a given frame, um, but then not act aggressively syncing the lifetime of variables um, or when you happen to inline two function calls into one stack frame, you very clearly have uh, delineated lifetimes of, of the local variables from those two child stack frames. Um, there's some cases where we have reduced warn, uh, we have warning false positives in, in Clang, um, particularly the use of designated initializers on global variables is one issue, and another one is in code that is dead code. Um, so just uh, due to architectural differences in, in GCC and, and LLVM, um, and how inlining occurs, or how often inlining occurs, or when inlining occurs versus semantic analysis. Um, this can lead to cases uh, where you might have like invalid assembly, but it's okay because it's dead code, and, and Clang is a little bit more aggressive about saying like, hey, no, something's really wrong here, um, and if it's dead code, does it really matter? Kind of thing, I think we can fix that up. Um, and then I think as far as looking at the set of LLVM tools and using them all as replacements for, for bin utils, um, I think the assembler support is gonna be the, the long tail, requires the most work. I think, I think we're really close with LLD for all architectures. Um, I'm not really worried right now about many of the other, like obj dump, obj copy, all these ones that are used by the kernel. Um, the assembler, I think there'll be a fair amount of work, but um, actually Linaro is as well, uh, kind of staffing up support for that, which is, which is really great. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, uh, we work entirely uh, or mostly, I guess, out of GitHub, hang out on IRC. Uh, we have a wiki, an issue tracker. Um, feel free to file a bug against blocking the meta bug in LLVM's issue tracker. Uh, I always evangelize for Godbolt. If you haven't seen this before, a compiler explorer. Um, it's a really great way of kind of sharing a concise link of some C code and, and some problematic code that was generated from any given compiler. It's really excellent, makes, is like great in, in bug reports. Um, C reduce is, is one of my best friends for figuring out, you know, we have a whole translation unit, something is wrong with it, uh, writing up a test case for figuring out what's important to figure out and then kind of minimizing it. And then from there, LLVM itself has another tool called bug point that can kind of further reduce things into LLVM IR is nice. Um, Bear is really nice for figuring out if you have like a make system that is very large, sometimes you want to know like exactly what was passed to the compiler. Uh, make equals uh, V equals one is helpful. Bear is really helpful for dumping this as JSON. Then a lot of tools in LLVM land can just like read this indirectly and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, kind of run whatever static analysis passes on um, exactly what was built and how it was built. And uh, the kernel itself, kbuild, will also dump these .cmd files everywhere that has more information. Um, actually, I'm gonna further evangelize Godbolt, because, yeah, it's pretty nice. I actually use it just for development, not just bug reports, because you can actually see how the compiler behaves a lot of times without having to really compile stuff, like, locally. Yeah, I think if you, like, rather than check out multiple different versions of different compilers, yeah. kind of thing, it's, it's pretty helpful. So, um, thanks for everyone, all of our contributors. 
Uh, shout out to some of our, our contributors, Joel, Nathan, Sadat, um, and a lot of folks on Lenaro's side helping us um, kind of test this both from both the kernel perspective but also from the LLVM uh, Linux side and uh, kind of contributing upstream to, to both of those projects. Um, wouldn't be able to, to do it without you. So uh, thank you very much for attending our talk, and uh, we have, I guess, five minutes for questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll give you a mic. We have a mic. Do you have a sense for uh, efficiency of the compiler? You know, is it, does it take approximately as long to build with GCC as with Clang? I know that the LLD linker, the, the linker is faster in that world because mm -hmm. it's more parallelized. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do you, have a, do you have a sense for like, is it about the same degree of difficulty? Does one do better than the other? Or are you looking at the build system performance as a piece of your yeah, I, evaluation? I, I, in, in general, I think like build build performance is is something that I, I think Google overlooks a little bit just because of how distributed in general build systems are kind of thing. I think it's it's something that that we know is definitely important and kind of from the top of like Linux kernel development, we've we've heard like compiler <coughs> compiler uh, speed is important kind of thing. I think um, I think there's more work to be done there. I don't actually have measurements kind of thing. I think most recently I was measuring LLD, for instance, right? It was like kind of justifying it internally, like can we turn this on? Is this good to do or not? And like one of the things we were finding with LLD at least was we can cut an AR64 all yes config link in half. Okay. So I think one interesting thing that happened there is that LLVM started out much faster than GCC, and that led the GCC developers to work on performance. So GCC got better, but then at the same time, LLVM added more features and got slower. So I think now they're, they're about the same. And I think like another thing is not just you know how, how fast did it compile, but like how much memory did it use, right? Because ultimately, when you try to parallelize a build, um, if, if you you know, you have a many core box, but not a lot of RAM. Eventually, your compiled jobs can exhaust the amount of memory, kind of thing. Um, so, it's like you know, many requirements in that regard. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. First one, uh, I want to know uh, what the um, performance improvement for LTO. Mm -hmm. Do you have the number about that? This, this is the first one. The second one is that uh, have you ever um, fixed what the bug uh, of the CFI? feature with uh, LTO? Oh, uh, yeah, so the, um, regarding LTO, I, I, don't, I don't have any numbers uh, kind of published or anything, but I would say roughly kind of single digit uh, per, mm. uh, percentage point okay. improvement. Um, and then for CFI, uh, I, I, I didn't do the work myself on it, but I believe there were issues found, um, particularly, I think the major issues in the Linux kernel that were found with CFI were differences in function signatures between translation <coughs> units. So for instance, if you, if you declare a function in a header and it's actually defined in a different translation unit but it's called from a, yeah, another translation unit and for some reason you're not, you're not using that header to share the, the declaration of the yeah. function, um, CFI was really, really good at, at finding those kind of differences yes. as yes. well. Um, so I think in order to get CFI building, it required fixing a, a lot of those. Um, yes. How many of those, uh, I believe the patches were sent upstream, but I, I could be wrong on that kind of thing. Um, and then it's meant to be a runtime, uh, like prevention of, of ROP chains. So there, like, unless someone is actively writing a ROP chain against the kernel, like, I, don't, I don't know how many attacks it stopped, perhaps. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And uh, thank we'll you. be in, the, uh, in the, the tool chain working group here if you want to chat or out in the hallway afterwards if you want to chat kind of thing. Thank you.